Good morning. Welcome to Melton Vineyard's online service for Sunday the 29th of May. It's lovely that you could join us for this and I hope you'll get loads from it. Last Sunday we baptised two new believers and it was a great occasion and of course each of those believers was in effect saying I'm a learner. I want to learn from Jesus. I want to learn from his Holy Spirit within so that I can grow in faith and understanding and followership of Jesus. So in this service I uh, am going to be talking a little later on about learning and how we learn from Jesus. First though as always we need to just direct our thoughts and our hearts uh, towards God before we listen to what he has to say to us. So we're going to worship Let's pray uh, and then we'll sing together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that in this moment we are able, if we so choose, to step into the very presence of God. We are able, if we use the words of these songs as prayers set to music, to lift our prayers to you. Would you inspire us again? Would you fill us by your Holy Spirit? Refill us. We need that refilling so that we can be your followers today and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm going to start with the reading from Luke's Gospel today. So this is Luke chapter 18 and I'm reading from verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and bless them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We've left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. You know, one thing I struggle to imagine whenever I watch films like Jesus of Nazareth or The Passion of the Christ or whatever it happens to be is Jesus paying much attention to children. He comes across as so serious and solemn and, well, grown up that it's hard to imagine children wanting to have anything to do with him, frankly. One recent dramatisation of the Jesus story, though, is different. It's called The Chosen, and in it Jesus actually comes across as fun, like you'd enjoy telling him a joke and he'd tell you one back. I don't know if you've watched any of The Chosen, but it's definitely worth a look. It's a multi-season retelling of the gospel story that's still being made, in fact. There are two seasons already out with more to come, so it's the sort of thing you might find on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Disney+, Plus. except that it's not on any of those platforms, probably because they'd be unlikely to fund anything that uncommercial. Well, in one of the very early episodes, Jesus befriends and teaches a group of children after they discover his camp on the outskirts of Capernaum. They love hanging out with him and he laughs and jokes with them. If I remember correctly, he even makes some farting noises at one point to make them giggle. But the serious point of the episode is that the children are genuinely curious about Jesus. They ask him all sorts of questions about who he is and what he's doing there and why and, and they listen carefully to his answers. They learn from him. And he says to them at one point, I hope that my next students ask the same questions you do and that they listen to my answers. But I suspect they do not have the understanding you do. And it's a beautiful commentary on that passage we just read. Jesus wants disciples who are like children, ready to listen, eager to learn. And here's another thing about children. They know they don't have all the answers. Matt Hyam, who for many years was senior pastor at Southampton Vineyard, recently published a book called There Must Be More to This. And this is his take on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. When I was a young Christian, he says, having been discipled in a good Baptist church, I knew everything. No, really, I did. But here's the, most, the second most important thing that I have learnt in all my time trying to follow Jesus. We are all wrong. 
We're not necessarily all wrong about all things, but we are all wrong about some things. Being someone who learns is the definition of a disciple. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's a pretty important part of following Jesus. If, however, we remain convinced that we are totally correct about everything, then it is impossible to be a disciple because we cannot learn anything. I find that so helpful. It helps me see what Jesus meant when he said that unless we receive the kingdom of God like a little child, we will never enter it.
question that the rich young man asks next is along similar lines. What must I do to inherit eternal life, he says. And that's basically the same question as what must I do to enter the kingdom of God. What does that phrase, eternal life, say to you? Living forever? Never getting old? Never having to die? A lot of people are chasing that dream these days, aren't they? Rich people getting themselves cryogenically frozen so that in a few centuries' time, when scientists have worked out how to cure every disease and reverse the ageing process, they can then be taken out of the freezer, warmed up again and live forever. It doesn't appeal to me, but perhaps as a slightly less extreme example, what about all those anti-ageing creams that promise to keep us looking fresh and youthful for longer? Well, that's not what the rich young ruler had in mind when he asked his question. Within a Jewish worldview, eternal life meant the life of the age to come. He wanted to know what he had to do to qualify for God's promised future. And there are prophecies throughout the Old Testament of a future age when God will be recognised as king by everyone. And when those who love him will enjoy peace and plenty. So here's just one example from the prophet Isaiah. Look, says God, I'm creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad. Rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. In those days, People will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards. For my people will live as long as trees and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. It's a picture of a world without war or hunger disease or death. That's what the young ruler is thinking about when he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to ensure that I'm part of that wonderful future that God has promised? So Jesus starts with the conventional answers. Well, you have to obey all the rules, don't you? Be a good person. Don't kill anyone. Don't steal from anyone. Don't cheat on anyone. Don't tell lies to anyone. Be nice to your mum and dad, etc., etc., but there's a note of warning as well in his response. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. In other words, no matter how good we think we are, we've all done bad stuff. We've told lies. We've cheated. We've been selfish. We've put our interests ahead of the interests of others. Yet despite the warning, the young man thinks he's doing pretty well. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he replies. So then Jesus delivers the punchline. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. What's Jesus saying? That if we want to look forward to life in God's future kingdom, we have to give away everything we have? That we all have to become paupers? No, no, no. The important bit comes at the end. Follow me. The young man thinks he's got life sorted. In his head, at least, he's doing all right. And often, you know, when I talk to people who wouldn't call themselves Christians, they'll say to me, I don't go to church, but I'm not a bad person. No, I've never killed anyone. I don't steal things. Why would God be mad at me? I mean, maybe you think like that too. Remember what Matt Hyam said? If we remain convinced that we are totally correct about everything then it's impossible to be a disciple because we cannot learn anything. That's the message here. Unless we are willing to question the things we know about life, unless we're willing to learn from Jesus, we haven't even got started on the journey. Contrary to what most people believe, Christianity is not about being a good person. It's about following Jesus, which, of course, should result in us becoming Good people. That's also the secret of eternal life. And here's the really cool bit. Unlike in Jewish thinking, the Gospel writer John declares that the life of the kingdom age is available to those living in the present age. Eternal life can start now. 
The life of the age to come starts now for those who are willing to enter it. But that's not easy for us to do. Not because God is unwilling to give, but because we are rich. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, says Jesus. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus uses a ridiculous image to drive his point home. This isn't a reference, as some have suggested, to a supposed gate in the walls of Jerusalem that was too small for a laden camel to go through. No such gate existed. It means exactly what it says. There is no reality in which a camel can go through the eye of a needle. It is impossible. And that is the point. The disciples are shocked. In their reality, worldly wealth was considered to be a sign of God's blessing. If even the blessed rich are excluded, how does anyone qualify for God's kingdom? Who then can be saved? They ask in astonishment. What is impossible with human beings is possible with God, is Jesus' reply. Friends, none of us qualify for God's kingdom on our own merits. It's an impossible scenario. We are broken. We fall short. We need Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection as our means of entry. And interestingly, in a moment, Jesus is going to remind his disciples again of what is about to happen to him. But it is especially difficult for those of us who are rich to wrap our heads around this. Why? Is it because God hates rich people? No, it's because rich people are usually holding on so tight to their money they can't open their hands to receive God's free gift. The money feels safer and more tangible than surrendering everything to God. That's the dilemma of the rich young man and he goes away sad. And you know, despite all the financial pressures we're facing now, the vast majority of us are rich, certainly when compared with how most people on this planet live. We are rich. And it's not really even a matter of how much money we have. We can be rich in other ways too. A big problem for many of us is that we can be intellectually rich. Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist, is intellectually rich. This is his understanding of life. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Christopher Hitchens, the British-American author and journalist, was intellectually rich. This was his version of the gospel. A virgin can conceive, a dead body can walk again, your leprosy can be cured, the blind can see, nonsense. Intellectual riches can prevent us from entering God's kingdom. Now, it's not necessary to leave our brains at the door in order to believe in God. Some of the most brilliant scholars and scientists living today have put their faith in Jesus. But if we trust the words of atheist intellectuals over and above the words of Jesus, we're in trouble. Of course, even believers can have a wobble now and again. We've left all we had to follow you, says Peter, obviously worried in case they've backed the wrong horse. And so Jesus makes a promise. Truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. The rewards of faith can be experienced now. We can experience the life of the age to come now as we seek God's kingdom first. So what is God's challenge to you today? Because he is challenging you. He's challenging me too. He's asking us to go deeper, to trust him more wholeheartedly and be willing to keep learning the lessons of faith that he wants to teach us. So what is Jesus wanting to teach you today? What's the biggest challenge in your life right now because I suspect that is where you'll also find God encouraging you teaching you leading you forward let's finish with a prayer Lord thank you that you are always looking for learners those who are willing to admit that we don't know everything and that there is always more for us to explore and discover 
Speak to us today, I pray, and over the coming days. Take us deeper into your eternal life, the life of the age to come, that has already started for those who've put their trust in you. And may we see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. If there's anything in this particular service that has spoken to you and you're watching the service live, don't forget, you can ask for someone to pray with you. If you'd like them to do that, just text this number 079-79-792132 and one of our trained prayer team can call you back and speak with you and pray with you over the phone if you would like them to do that. If you're watching at another time, you can still request prayer by emailing prayer at meltonvineyard.org.uk. Lovely, as always, to spend this time with you. And I do hope that if you live in the Melton area and you're free this afternoon, that you will join us as we meet together at the United Reformed Church building on Chapel Street, four o'clock, and uh, we will be continuing this series in Luke's Gospel. Bye for now.